Okay, dear friends, dear colleagues, I would like this afternoon's session to start now and proudly introduce the winner of last year's Siletto Prize. And just to remind you, the Siletto Prize is a prize for community participation and engagement. This prize is sponsored by the Siletto Trust and celebrates a deep, continuous and empowering involvement between a museum and its stakeholders that places the museum as a point of orientation and reference at the center of its communities, whether these be local, national, global, or otherwise divine. Um, the canon Yavus, do I pronounce that right? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Ethnography Museum from the remote village of Besnipar in Turkey has managed to find very effective ways to advocate the conscious return to local roots and heritage. This museum addresses the dramatic transformation of Turkey during the last century as a result of migration from villages to cities and the abandonment of many villages. The Kenan Yavuz Museum aimed and successfully aims now to reverse this trend by demonstrating how cultural projects and great, um, greater awareness of the richness of village heritage can revitalize villages and the lives of their residents, young and old. I am, as I am sure all of you present here today, are very excited to hear how this museum although only founded in 2019 by Kanan and his family, has preserved and revived the tangible and intangible heritage of local villages in the Beirut region. I'm equally curious how the winning of the Siletto Prize affected this museum. So let me ask on stage our colleague from Turkey, Mr. Kanan Yafus, to start his keynote address on his approach on how museums can be rooted in their, in their communities and make a difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. It is a wonderful day and to have this excitement of standing behind so many great individuals. And when I see the faces here, I see so much experience and so much knowledge that we share with each other. And uh, it is a story that we will share that we still cannot believe uh, where it led us to. And today, the story that we are going to be sharing is a story of a family and a family story that became of Anatolia. And we will talk about the region, the journey we went through, and what has happened since winning an award by the European Museum Forum last year. And um, hopefully, uh, after sharing this journey with us, we'll also see you in our museum located in Bayburt. It's going to be a definitely a rememberable journey, a little bit far, but I, I'm pretty sure that you'll be enjoying it. And, um, to start with, uh, this is our family. You might have seen us, uh, especially me and my father. We love taking pictures and videos. <laughs> <laughs> and you'll see why. We definitely leverage them as much as possible. And um, it is founded by our family. It is founded by my father and my mother. So it's, it's slightly different with absolutely zero funding. And the journey has been quite, uh, quite challenging. But we found creative ways to engage with the locals and with the community who helped us tremendously. And, and that led us to where we are today. Uh, uh, you see my brother on the left, my mother, my father, uh, my sister-in-law, and myself uh, standing uh, at our gala night, premiere night, which is also very uh, unthinkable to, to, to say. And um, that was a night that we hosted to celebrate our documentary film uh, that, we, uh, that we produced after winning the awards, as the, the public was very interested in knowing our story. Um, to begin with, the, the region that we're going to be talking about is Bayburt. So Bayburt is uh, located in the East Turkey. It's around uh, roughly 18 hours by drive from Istanbul. You need to take a plane, maybe one and a half hour flight, and then you will be driving for another an hour and a half. Uh, even though you're going to be very, very tired, uh, we will make sure that you have the right food and drinks uh, so that you can <laughs> revive and actually enjoy the museum. And um, there, there's also a sad part about Bayburt. So it's the city that has lost the biggest population to the migration to the western part of Turkey, which caused uh, cultural erasion. Uh, it caused um, much more economic drastic drop down. And um, as you can imagine, it created a circle of um, losing more and more. And um, that was the, the beginning of the story. 
Um, my father uh, is born and uh, he was raised in Yukarıluru, Peshpunar village, which is from Bayburt. It is around 45 minutes drive uh, from the city center, but back when he was born in, it was around a four hour drive by a truck, if you could find one. And uh, so the conditions were not ideal. Uh, it is at a high altitude, so the, the sky is beautiful. Uh, we have star nights for our guests. And um, he, he, he saw that potential when he was a kid. He said, I'm going to leave this village now for my education and to pursue my career. But when I come back, I want to do something. He didn't know what it was, neither did we. And um, many, many years later, he married my uh, mother. Uh, they were in Istanbul living. He continued his education. And after becoming a professional, uh, and, um, he was constantly thinking about his, um, his home. That was, um, that was abandoned uh, when they had to leave the, the village. Uh, his parents decided it was the best to leave the village, go to the city where their children could be educated better. Uh, but once they left the house behind, the new tenants didn't take care of it as much as one would like. So the house was completely lost to uh, renovations that um, uh, we wouldn't be finding idyllic. Uh, so this was the house that the, the original house was. And, uh, but we will come to the point how we have a picture of it, even though it was completely lost. <laughs> so in 2012, um, we decided we needed a house in the village to be able to go back there and host the family and host many, many members of our family. We have a big, big family. I'll show a dinner picture. And it's quite <laughs> fascinating to, to see that many people all together. This is my grandmother on the, on the front, uh, my father, uh, my grandmother, again, uh, my mother, and uh, our family members in front of the house um, that we built right here in order to accommodate all the guests that we were uh, having in the village. Uh, so it was a house, still not a museum, because nobody knew that it was going to become a museum in the future. Uh, once we established this house and started to host uh, members, my father also remembered that when he was a kid, his favorite thing to do was to go to the cinema. But of course, that was very difficult, since it was in the Bayburt city center. Four hour drive, only one way to Bayburt, four hours to come back. And there is, of course, he, if he could find some coins forgotten in his grand great father's jacket uh, that he could borrow <laughs> uh, for a while and go to the cinema. And ironically, in 2012, there, there was zero cinemas in Bayburt uh, around the city. So he thought, why don't we build an amphitheater in the garden where we could facilitate cinema evenings for the kids of the village so they could come in the evenings and they could watch, watch movies. And that, that's what we did. But of course, since we had this lovely, small but cozy space, uh, we decided to host events for the kids, uh, whether it was um, dancing or theaters. And um, one thing led to another. And uh, it was one of the most uh, loved venues for the village uh, kids, as well as the neighboring villages, uh, because people talk. Uh, they say, hey, there's a lovely house you can go to, and there's cinema, and they give chocolate as well in the evening. And, um, it, and it, was, it made us very, very happy. Um, in the meantime, we started to search for the unwanted. And um, the region um, back then and still is improving, did not have the knowledge of the importance of preserving the history and, and the culture. Uh, for many individuals, perhaps an old item might be something that would be the best to burn uh, for fire, or it would be a storage item, or uh, better even to throw out. We have found many, many historic items that were thrown out and uh, that we had to renovate, and uh, now they are preserved in the museum in the best way possible. So we were actually visiting the houses, going to the garage um, at the back of the, the places and uh, finding items that we thought were treasures. And when we asked for them to donate it or even to sell it in the beginning, they were quite shocked that we wanted these items. They were like, why do you, why do you want this? <laughs> and um, so we were, we were starting to gather an, a collection of items that we stored in the garden. Uh, we built a small exhibition room and we placed these items with the names that they belonged to. And with that method, once people's names were actually exhibited uh, in, the, in, in the exhibition room, people started thinking, I, I want my name to be there. Uh, I, I also have an item or two. So people were actually very excited to give many items. So the exhibition room started to grow very, very, very fast. And in the meantime, there was something else happening. So on the left, you see my grandmother, and on the right, my, is my mother. And they absolutely loved welcoming people. And uh, even since we were having these events happening in the garden, and it, it was becoming a place for people to visit, even though it was our private property, <laughs> they were like, hey, can we have a look at the garden? We are like, yeah, sure, come in. And then my grandmother was inviting them for tea, for coffee, for lunch, uh, whatever it might be. And my mother did the exact same. So people uh, kept coming more and more. 
And uh, the popularity grew, and uh, we started to host concerts, uh, music evenings, dinner gatherings, and memorable days uh, for, for the event. And uh, once the events were growing, we, uh, we happened to uh, establish something that we didn't know we were establishing throughout the years. So from 2012 until 2019, uh, in, which in, happened in 2019, Kenayo's Ethnography Museum was founded. Uh, why we chose Ethnography Museum? Uh, it was because of the things that we cared about, the things that we were actually representing without knowing we were representing. They were the items that were lost, it was the dances that were not being danced anymore, the songs that were not sung, and the ways of living, and the, the items that were lost so far. And then um, that was the beginning of, of course, a very, very new chapter for our museum. So these are just a few things that, uh, that the, we think ethnography should be representing, that we think we should protect more. It's the music, the, the cuisine, the nature, uh, it's the dance, the architecture, and agriculture. And we try to improve it every day even more with, uh, with more guidance that we have and with more volunteers that we have on board. And um, a dream of EMIA, of course, uh, arose. Uh, when we were a museum, we were like, oh, imagine if we did get an award for EMIA, or just to be able to uh, be part of such an incredible process. And that's what we did. This was a footage that I placed uh, the camera on the night of um, EMIA ceremony last year. And because of the pandemic, it happened online, of course. And um, when we dressed, uh, you know, in the middle of the pandemic, nobody's going out, so we dressed. <laughs> And um, we were in the living room, there was nobody, and uh, we, we were laughing <laughs> because we were like, look at us, what are we doing? What if we don't mean anything? And then you're just going to be people who are dressed for nothing in the house. <laughs> and I also had a, pre a speech prepared on my next laptop, and the more awards were given, my mother was really sad. He said, she said, oh my God, you're not going to be able to make your speech. I was like, it's fine, it's fine, it's, it's, it's an amazing experience. But, um, but then it happened. Uh, Miss Carol Jackson, who couldn't be with us today, um, announced our name, and the moment she said, can I? It was before Ethnography Museum, we were already screaming and jumping in the living room. And thankfully, that was not streamed <laughs> in that moment. Um, but it was a very happy moment, and we couldn't believe that it was happening. We did manage to get some reactions from our family and friends who, who shared it with us. So I'll try to. Oh, actually, before that, apologies for that. I want to also show the video that we participated to Emia with, which summarizes some of the things that I mentioned with a little bit of more detail. It takes five minutes, so I will leave it to it. Hoş geldiniz. Welcome to Kenan Yavuz Ethnography Museum. What you see is a two-bedroom village house, a replica in which my father was born. A house that did not survive the years that passed, but its memories most certainly did. Little did we know that rebuilding memories in our garden located here in Yukarlıoğlu village Bayburt, Turkey, would soon turn into a wave of support and growth that eventually became the most visited private-owned museum in the country, Bayburt. A city that had been featured in the epic tales of Dede Korkut, recognized by UNESCO in the representative list of intangible cultural heritage of humanity, experienced the second most rapid population loss with migration to the larger cities in the country, inevitably endangering the heritage of the region. My father said, I'd like to revive the past. I'd like the past to live. And as a family, we started a cultural center to tell our story, exhibiting items passed through generations, uniting with schools, organizations, and most importantly, with the locals, to create awareness on the fact that the beauties of Anatolia, the way of living here in Bayburt, deserves to be revived, preserved, and experienced. Today, Tandır'da ekmek pişirme şenliğimizi yapıyoruz. Anadolu'nun güzelliklerini bugüne, bugünün güzelliklerini geleceğe taşımak için müzeyi inşa ettik. Locals, too, started to bring their own heirlooms, whether they are letters, boxes, tools of agriculture, for they too wanted the names of their loved ones to live. Each piece in our collection comes with their own stories. Real people, real stories, memories everywhere, made us the museum we are today. My grandmother, even at the days when we have a thousand visitors per day, will try greeting each one of them, offering tea. For her, each corner of the museum is a memory of her own. My mother, the architect of our project, has been the essence of order and aesthetic. Born and raised in Istanbul with roots to Albania, she became the designer of experiences to make sure regardless of where you come from, your gender, your age, financial or academic background, you will be bonded with Bayburt and feel that you aren't here to observe only, but also to participate. This is a place where it's not just a museum, 
Yaşayan müze zaten adından da belli. Çok güzel zamanlar geçiriyoruz. Daha nice nice anılar adıyorum. Hikat. The dialect is one of many things we wish to preserve. Hosting story competitions for kids, storytelling hours in our library, speaking the words of the region. Lor. One of many things you will taste once you visit us. In our annual harvest festival, you will turn the hay into a rope, crop the harvest, pile it, thresh it, take it to the mill, and finally make bread to taste the experience truly. Ehram, we support ethnic production to be revived, allowing talents to grow, supporting women of the society to get together and empower each other. Ağızbarı, you will see many singing songs while folk dancing on the roof of our village house. There may even be a bride walking in, digitizing folk music to make sure it will survive the centuries to come. Kırman, making sure to revive the unique architectural features in every corner. We've successfully restored an Armenian fountain located in our neighbor village Pushke and is now a must visit place for all our guests. Through the permanent exhibition Chinimachin, we created awareness on the lost tiles of Byward Castle, which recently is being restored to its original, outstanding exterior. The locals took ownership and responsibility as though the museum is their own, helping us grow, host and present the best values we have. Academicians referencing us in their researches as part of ecotourism and eco-museums. Journalists, TV presenters, social media influencers helped us spread the word quicker than we could ever imagine. We are not alone. We've never been and we will never be. We create opportunities for volunteering and our advisory board with whom we design the future of our museum consists of wonderful volunteers who are teachers, farmers, artists, economists, authors, executives, helping us get better every day. Our goal is to create a tourism demand focused on cultural heritage of Bayburt, creating jobs, contributing to the local economy, generating, seeking solutions to the social issues, starting a chain of reactions that will one day put a stop to migration to the larger cities and allow future generations to see the great potential and opportunities that lay here in Bayburt. We believe the impact we wish to make locally will be much stronger through the recognition from an international organization as the European Museum Forum. We look forward to the journey that's ahead of us. We also look forward to meeting you and welcoming you. Greetings from Kenan Yavuz Ethnography Museum. Thank you very much. And um, as you as you probably felt the, the emotions that we have felt during that journey, um, uh, we captured a few moments, as I mentioned, of our families. And um, I believe you're going to be seeing much more on the award ceremony this week, which I really, really look forward to. And uh, so this was and what has happened. And now the Celeto Prize for 2021. The museum which has won this award, although young in age, has managed to find very effective ways to advocate the conscious return to local roots and heritage. I did. It is very successful in engaging its local community and is equally forceful in demonstrating how cultural projects which build on the richness of village heritage, village heritage. regenerate rural, social <laughs> and economic... Come on, TM. The prize 2021 goes to... Come on. Goes to the Ken and Yavels. Yes! The Ken and Yavels <laughs> Ethnography <laughs> Museum, Vespina, Turkey. And now I would like to turn over to the Yavuz family of the Ken and Yavuz Ethnography Museum in Turkey, which I had the pleasure of visiting last year. So, Celeto Prize winner for 2021, you are on. Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. This is Rukhan Yavuz, member of the advisory board here at Kenan Yavuz Ethnography Museum. And I'm here with the co-creators of the foundation, my mother, Sibeli Yavuz, and my father, Kenan Yavuz. <laughs> As a family, we cannot express our happiness and the pride. I'll pass that in here. I was very excited and thankfully, <laughs> thankfully there was that moment where they were showing pictures, so I was trying to weep off my tears away. 
I was like, okay, I need to get my things together. And then, then that was the beginning of everything changing, of course. Uh, we had the pleasure of visiting 14 Henrietta Streets in Dublin, who were the winners of 2020 to uh, have the award ceremony, uh, received it over. And um, we were, that, that, that was the moment that we realized everything is getting more serious. And then we had to, now we, we had the public responsibility to do even more and give people the opportunity to help us do even more. And um, a brand new chapter at Kenavis Ethnography was uh, growing, and we made sure all the buildings that we were building were ethnographically uh, eth fitting with the, with the cultural values that we were having, even though many people had many ideas. Sometimes I would have an idea, everybody would say no. My father would have an idea, I would say no. And then we would find the right one that would actually fit with the museum as we were afraid of losing our core values once we were so excited. Uh, so far, it's going really well, and hopefully with the advisory board, we will continue to do so. And um, then, uh, the, the biggest change has happened when we realized we need to document things. And uh, not through our uh, cameras, uh, the, the phones, but actually an official uh, documentary to make sure that you know, future generations will know what has happened here and what people can do uh, with little resources, with little knowledge, if you actually want to change something in a region, you actually can change. And the documentary was filmed and it's premiered. Now it's uh, available on YouTube uh, for everyone uh, to, to witness the story. So I would like to show a minute long trailer of the movie with you. <laughs> Elinizi uzatarak yıldızlara dokunabilecek kadar kendinizi yakın hissedersiniz. Neler oldu, neler oldu? Neler oldu, neler oldu? Anadolu kilitlenmeyen kapılar ülkesidir. Buranın bir ruhu var, sadece bir müze değil. Yaşayan ve yaşatan müze sloganımız, mottomuz. Neredeyim tam olarak? Bayburt'tayım. Kenan Yavuz Etnografya Müzesi'ne doğru birazdan kısa bir yolculuğa çıkacağım. Adının ne olduğunu bilmediğim bir hayalle geçti çocuk. Avrupa'nın en prestijli müzecilik ödülünün verildi. Bizim verdiğimiz mesaj şu, değişmemesi gereken güzelliklerimizi korumamız gerekiyor. Now I would like to share our mission and vision and what we'd like to do in the future, briefly. Um, our mission is that we would like to continue our responsibilities to the region, to Anatolia, uh, while we are reviving the values of it. We would like to um, start and raise an awareness on the immigration that is damaging the region and find creative ways that works for both the youth the, the people who would live there and for the future generations. The architecture of Anatolia that's being lost due to many, many reasons, but mostly financially. The social life that has been changing drastically with people migrating to the Western cities, uh, uniting with nature, which has been much more, much more di difficult with the lives of the urban life. Unite, uh, sh sharing more with the locals and making sure that we are collaborating Accessibility, making sure that everybody who visits the museum, regardless of their background in education or their age, they do relate with it, they understand what it is about, and when they leave, they leave as cultural ambassadors. And last but not the least, creation without loss. We believe change can happen without damaging what was already there. So while we are preserving these, our vision is that one day, Bayburt is going to become a popular tourism destination in Turkey, and the migration is going to be reversed. So we're going to see an increase in the population of the region. The future of Ethnography Museum relies with all of us. We are looking forward to uniting and collaborating with many, many more museums. We believed international recognition would be what was needed for a bigger impact locally, and it actually was. We have seen an incredible increase in the publicity that we had, the support that we received, the credibility that we had in our projects, and then moving forward, we will do the exact same. With that said, I would like to thank everybody here who has been here, the European Museum Forum, the European Museum of the Year Awards, the jury, and the host of uh, Estonia National Museum, and uh, we will be look forward to welcoming you at our museum uh, in Bayburt very soon and um, thank you so much for your time. I want to thank you so much for your inspiring and passionate uh, story. It's a wonderful story. Thank you so much. Really yes. appreciate it. Yes. And thank you for the amazing support and, uh, and the reactions. It made me very emotional here as well. <laughs> I will, for one, definitely go and visit your museum. That's for sure. And I'm I think uh, a lot of us uh, in the audience as well. 
Uh, we're almost there. We have uh, uh, five minutes. So has anybody in the audience have a question for Kenan? We've seen quite enough videos. <laughs> They're like very explanatory. <laughs> no questions. Well, maybe I can pose a question. Absolutely. I mean, you have such a loving family and I think it's exceptional to build a cultural center together with your family. Your father started it. Uh, it's exceptional, but does it pose challenges as well, working with your family? It definitely does. <laughs> It has been very difficult. If you have uh, seen my father, he's he likes to act fast, and uh, that, that that certain times um, raises questions of concern. We've built our uh, boutique accommodation, and um, we, we never had the chance or the finances to work with an architecture or anything. And we, we thought we wanted to do it, like you know, we wanted it to be our piece as a family. So I was finding online courses, uh, resources to actually design it. And one day, my father sends me a video where they're laying the foundation. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> with concrete in the garden, uh, with actual floor plans. And I was like, I didn't even finish the sketches. What's happening here? Yeah. <laughs> so immediately I flew from Dublin where I live to Bywood and uh, tried to change as much as possible. <laughs> but the <laughs> But uh, we, in the end, we find a way to work together, and that's the beauty of it. I think it's a very rare occasion where you call your team, your mother, your grandmother, uh, your brother, and your father. So I feel very, very lucky to be part of such a project. And um, I, I think that also adds a bit of lots of energy and synergy to it, because once we succeed, we succeed together, we share it together. But now it's not just the family, uh, because everybody who is participating, for example, the board of directors, board of advisors, some, most of them have never been to Anatolia before, and now they feel home. And they say, "Oh, uh, we miss we miss our house." They say, "Not the museum. Uh, we should we should go there. We should visit each other." And um, so I guess if we are able to reflect that opinion of you know, family is not just about blood. You don't have to be related by blood. It's something that you call to people that you trust the most and you want to be spending your time with. Uh, but yeah, against the challenges, uh, it's, it's it's been a great journey. <laughs> okay, that's great. Well, I had a couple of questions, more questions, but you answered them all in your beautiful story. So I guess it's time anyway. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you everyone. <laughs>
That's why you have this lovely picture, and uh, normally it's the end of the museum, where you see a family in front of a map of the world. It's the last thing at the museum they do. They take a picture uh, of themselves and they fill in a paper where they put where they come from or where their parents come from or their grandparents. Uh, uh, they really love to do it. As you see, it's a nice picture. The museum, as I told you, is located in Molebeek. It's a highly stigmatized area. The museum was born from a civil society association called Foyer, and Foyer means home in French. It's an association that has been active for more than 50 years uh, in Brussels, and it's recognized in Belgium as a pioneer in working with migrants. Due to this, the museum just received, we call the museum MMM, just received for Belgium the European Heritage Label 2021. The museum started um, 55 years ago, 54 years ago, uh, when we were starting to make the preparations for the organization that celebrated his, uh, that it was 50 years old. And then colleagues of us um, realized and told, it's a pity we see a lot of children, a lot of grandchildren who don't know the story of their parents or their grandparents. And that's how the idea suddenly started to build a museum. It was not a problem collecting stories because, uh, because of the association, the nature of the association. We consciously choose not to engage in polarization, but we want to let migra migrants tell objectively their story. It is a mix of Brussels post-war, second war, migrants, refugees, and also citizens of member countries in the European Union, as you can see here. You see Anne-Marie, she's not so young, um, but uh, last until last year, she loved to ride with a bicycle in Brussels. She's from the Netherlands, although the text you see, Aquí vive una ciclista, is in Spanish. And this shows the connection uh, we have at the museum. Then you see a lovely picture um, of a mine worker. Magali uh, brought us uh, uh, objects of her dad, even uh, a, a piece of paper that showed he was only 13 when he started to work in, in uh, Brussels, in uh, Charleroi, in the mines with his father. The third object is from the daughter of a Hungarian refugee. We have four committees that are guiding the museum. We have a steering group and committees for scientific historical input, very, very important. A pedagogical and a participatory guidance as well. We are an interactive bottom-up museum working consciously from a local and global perspective. Think global, act local, or the words of my director, she is Italian. Visitors should feel like visiting Brussels in a nutshell, assisting at personal stories from a historical, historical perspective. And here, what you see here are the permis de travail uh, of workers we had in the 60s. In the 60s, we had a lot of people coming from abroad, working on the reconstruction of Brussels. Half of the people working at Brussels then on the field uh, came from other countries. Let us look at some of MMM's values and foundation as written on its side. We want to highlight the diverse diversity of migration movements and let this super diversity take precedence over numbers, although we as well use numbers, uh, historical and scientific. We try to build a collection from grassroots level, starting with the inhabitants themselves. We work with a minimum of 50 showcases that contain stories with objects and photos told and given by the migrants themselves. And we have a timetable, as you can see, and a touch screen that offer an objective framing. We try to be accessible to people who are not used visiting museums. Being accessible is essential for us. So we also have created, and I think 
several museums already have it. But um, here it's special because it's a team of migration. We have created a multi-sensory project where blind people, as you can see on the picture, can experience the story of Brussels migration through sensing, hearing and smelling. For example, they sense a boat that came with refugees. It's a completely uh, other experience. We want to consider not just the cognitive, but also the empathic aspect, as most of the museums do, uh, as I hear here. We do this also through art. This is the interest of the museum. Okay, time. Artists can create an atmosphere and support things emotionally. As you see here, this is the local. We have here an artist who was a refugee from Ethiopia uh, with his mosaic. Here um, at the end, both at the museum, we have a Sicilian artist who collected uh, the wrecks of a boat with refugees from the Mediterranean Sea. And around it, he made uh, pictures uh, to talk about it. Participative, as you can see here, we have events uh, with people from Molenbeek as well. And people coming from uh, other sides of Brussels, other countries as well, visiting Brussels afterwards. Several events, as you can see, Spanish, Joska Shows from Hungary and the Roma community. We have about 20 event, um, six exhibitions and 20 events uh, every year. Here you see workshops for children, families, very important. Uh, for high schools, university coming at the museum. We also developed with Corona the museum, um, the mobile museum, and it's my colleague going to, uh, to the schools. Uh, during the, the pandemic, he went to the schools with objects of the museum. And here I finish with this picture, Senor Gamero. I wanted to end it with his last picture. Um, it's a quite modest picture, but it tells uh, the key words of the museum, and that is respect and understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you for uh, your interesting example for uh, uh, refugees, these uh, ideas. Yeah, thank you. So, Nano, ne Nano Nagel, please. Uh, just to say first, um, I loved hearing Ferkin's story of everyone, of, you know, being at home and finding out that you won the Celestia Prize. Congratulations. And, and to say, I can't wait to see everyone's reactions tonight when, you know, the winners are announced. But I was, um, I share an office with the lovely Sasha O'Brien, who is our Education and Outreach Officer, and Susanna Ahern, who's here too, um, our Sales and Events Manager. And when the email came to say that we had won the Council of Europe Museum Prize, I was on my own in the office. It was a 4th of December. I don't know why I was on my own. But anyway, the email came in, I opened it, read it and went, Ha, ha, ha. And then I did what small dogs do when they're really excited and I ran around in circles. And then I ran around the site crying and hugging people and social distancing was still in place and they, do, they didn't want to be hugged. But anyway, it was a great way of celebrating. So uh, we're going to have a video and then we're going to talk rapidly at you for two minutes. Nano Nagel Place is a site of living heritage. What drives this place is a desire for justice and how learning and compassion can achieve it. The root of this mission is Nano Nagel, who rejected a life of ease for a life of risk by daringly running illegal schools for poor children 300 years ago. Our museum tells her story and that of the religious congregation she founded, the Presentation Sisters. This is a living story because sisters still live and work here. This is the place where Nano Nagel began her schools and it's where she's buried. We Presentation Sisters are now spread over five continents, but this is our home. And for many years we've had a dream that we might transform this site into a fitting tribute to Nano Nagel, where her heritage could be preserved and where her work could be continued. We really didn't know where to start, 
until about 2011, we gathered some wonderful partners and the dream began to take shape. It became real and we made Nanonagel Place. Nano Nagel Place houses the archive of the Presentation Sisters. This is our collective memory, revealing the past, explaining the present, and providing guidance for the future. At the Lantern Community Development Project, we offer community education and events. We support people who are vulnerable or marginalised in the community. We allow people the space to reflect on what supports their well-being. Cork Migrant Centre is all about creating safe spaces for migrant uh, families, children and youth to experience well-being and integration. It is a space for capacity building, be it creating social networks, social connections, knowledge and skills. We really have a focus on families and children living in all the direct provision centers in Cork. Nano Niagara Place aims to be a village in the city. University, urban greening, sustainable food, culture, community, museum, all that's good in Cork all in the same place. Nano Nagel Place, Cork, Ireland. Proud winners of the Council of Europe Museum Prize 2022. So we absolutely loved seeing all the videos and images that you had of kids in the museum and kids in the museum are really important to us. So we just want to talk about that for a minute. I'm going to hand over to Sosha. Uh, thanks, Daniel. Um, such an honour to be here today and I only found out yesterday that I was going to be doing this panel so I'm a bit nervous so bear with me. Uh, please be nice. Um, so <laughs> um, actually, I've met some of you so I know you're very nice. Um, so we are in a very unique position. Uh, the Presentation Sisters continued Nan O'Neagle's educational mission after her death and they set up schools not only across Ireland but also across the world. Um, they have a connection with uh, Nano Nagel's history, so therefore we have a connection with them. Um, so many Irish present presentation schools are uh, classified as DESH schools, which means that they're in underprivileged areas uh, or socially deprived areas, but they also regularly visit us uh, and we are able to connect with them as well uh, and bring them through the museum at a young age. Uh, in the video that you just saw as well, we have this wonderful actor uh, named Judy Chalmers, and she has taken on uh, the persona of Nano Nagel, um, and she dresses up in Nano's full 18th century costume, of course, a replica version. Um, and she connects with these children who come into the museum, um, and she also facil facilitates school programming, both on-site and online. And during COVID, we really got an opportunity to connect with the international schools that are... Um, in Australia, New Zealand, America, um, and we were able to zoom into their classrooms, facilitated by Judy, of course, um, and talk to them about the story of Nano Nagel, but also bring it uh, into the 21st century, as we keep saying, bringing Nano's story into the 21st century, um, asking the students who they think um, would be Nano's 21st century equivalent today, um, what they can do to change the world like Nano did, uh, and we also, we usually get answers like Greta Thunberg is Nano's equivalent. Um, so we definitely think Nano should have won a Nobel Prize while she was alive. So I'm going to pass back over to Danielle now. So just kind of uh, building on that, that um, this session is about empathy. And so we do use historical empathy to connect people to the story of Nano Nagel. And we use that aspect of historical consciousness that's about using a figure from the past um, that has these universal values uh, that are still relevant now and that are re relevant, you know, in the in the future. And we were so taken with the Occupation Museum in Aarhus, I can't see where you are, um, but it was so uh, impressive to see you using historical empathy and um, multi 
multi, I can never say this word, multi-perspectival approaches to history, you know, to, to get um, children to understand that people made a decision in the past in a context that they have to understand. Um, I think that's probably never been more important. And we also want to be a, a research-led museum in, in, in terms of teaching history to be a bit disruptive. The penal laws, the period in which Nano Nagel lived, we're, we need there, um, were... Um, They've been revised a lot, so we want to introduce ideas of revisionism. There's an amazing um, Irish historian called Liam Kennedy, and he's come up with something called the Mope Theory of Irish History, and he says that Irish people think they're the most oppressed people ever, and he's done a lot of work <laughs> to dispel that, and we want to kind of do that kind of work as well and introduce like new, new approaches to, to history because it's still taught as a narrative in Irish schools. I'm going to hand back to Sosh for a second. We're going to speed up. <laughs> Flip-flop. Um, so Danielle just mentioned the kind of multi-perspectival history and engaging families as well is really important to us. Um, so we've worked on an educational program uh, for really young kids as well as older kids. Um, so one of the programs uh, is called Hop Into History. It's, a, it's aimed at kids who are three to seven years old, um, which is very fun. <laughs> Um, so we invite kids to uh, hop into history and they do an 80 year time jump back in time um, with one of our resident sisters, Sister Patricia, who's 87. Um, and she, they hop back in time and they get to experience what her childhood was like went back 87 years ago when she was young. Um, and then they keep continuing to hop back in time until they get to Nano's time, so the 18th century. And then we go through our museum and we do a guided tour with different objects that help them connect with um, the past. We also have um, an interactive cabinet of curiosities called Museum in a Box. I'm so sorry. Um, and... <clears throat> That <laughs> uh, that <Understand>. allows <laughs> that's uh, aimed at slightly older kids, um, so they each get objects, and it kind of breaks this barrier of uh, when kids enter the museum, they're usually not allowed to touch things. Uh, so we wanted to break that barrier down and invite kids to become history detectives. So they have a magnifying glass and wear white gloves, uh, and they can touch the objects, smell the objects. Sometimes they taste the objects, which is an interesting <laughs> part of my job. Um, and that just allows them, again, to connect with the, their history and the past um, in a totally different and uh, exciting way. <coughs> And just to tell you to look up, I'm since sorry, we don't have time to talk about it, but very... look up the Playful Culture Trail, which happened in Cork City over the summer, which was all 15 museums okay. in Cork working together to kind of reinterpret the city as a playful space and a museum. So there you go. Last sales job. Fall to Ireland, be so proud. Oh, OK, OK. OK. <laughs> anyway, I congratulate you. <laughs> OK, so... OK, so... Uh, a little more Maz Mira. <laughs> Hello, my name is Elena Juncosa. I'm the director of the Masmiro Foundation. We are so excited and so nervous to be uh, EMEA nominee, especially this year that we celebrate 100 years of the farm, the most emblematic uh, painting of Joan Miro's figurative work. Masmiro is the model of this famous painting that was bought by Ernest Hemingway and actually is on display at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. It's a pleasure to be here with all these fantastic museums around Europe. So thank you so much uh, to the European Forum Museum for the opportunity to share our project with all of you. And also congratulations to all other nominees. I think it's great to meet uh, the directors of the museums, uh, but uh, for our jobs, uh, we always need our team. So on stage with me is my colleague, uh, Kim Packard. He has uh, only been uh, working with us for a short time, but he will explain us the, our project. Okay, thank you, Elena. Um, so yeah, my name is Kim Packard. I'm the head of activities at Masmiro. And so Mas Miró is in Monroch, uh, the south of Barcelona. It's about an hour away from Barcelona. Um, Mas Miró, which means Catalan, uh, in Catalan it means Miró Farm, is the old summer house where the surrealist artist Juan Miró came almost every year um, of his life, which is now a museum open to visitors since 2018. Um, the trees, birds, stars, and all the daily objects of this farmhouse are all part of Miró's work in a way. The house, the studio, are all intact and almost exactly how Miro left them in 1976. 
The farm offers the visitors to connect and understand who Mido was and what inspired him throughout his whole life. As many of his friends would say at the time, to understand Mido, you must understand Munroch. So the farm is also a window into the culture of the region, its landscape, smells, sounds, textures. What inspired Mido was not only the static scenery, yet how the farm and the region was alive. We try to stay true to this idea by keeping a museum alive and in motion as well. For example, this year, um, because it's the centennial, we're organizing various uh, events. Um, for example, we're making an audio theatrical piece where the visitors will be able to listen um, to two of the trees talking to each other. Uh, uh, we're also um, hosting a contemporary music opera based on the constellation of Zmiro, or also, for example, a performance throughout the town of, uh, based on the folklore and traditions of, Muz of Munroc. Um, in 1911, when Miro was 18, he fell, in, he fell ill and depressed. Um, doctors recommended him to leave Barcelona, where he was working as an accountant at the time, following his father's demands. Um, Miro moved to the farm, and is here where he gains back his health, and decides to dedicate his life to art, against his father's wishes. The farm and its surrounding restored Miro and gave him the strength to follow his dream and his heart. During his whole life, the beats, the mountains, the sky, and the relaxed atmosphere of the farm helped him move forward and become the artist, the radical artist we all know today. But Masmido is not only a unique for its historical significance, which it also brings many crucial elements of our society together. We connect the relevance of our natural landscape, um, our, the creativity, innovation, and critical thinking, all aspects that Mido, that we find in Mido's work through the lens, for example, through the lens of Mido, an olive tree becomes much more than an olive tree. Its shape, texture, culture, nature, and so much more. Mido's work and Mido's story shows us the importance of the landscape, and through the landscape, we try to show the importance of Mido. Munroch is a small town in the area of Baishkam. Um, the, the landscape is primarily based is primarily olive trees, hazelnuts, and almond trees. The agricultural richness is bonded with the cuisine and traditions. Yet all this cultural and natural heritage has been and still today often being pushed aside and being lost. Mido being born in 1893 in a large industrial city such as Barcelona perceived this and he wanted to treasure and protect this area. Um, so, and these landscapes, they're very important as we all know, um, and many of us have talked about during these presentations, are crucial for our health, our sense of identity, our emotional well-being, and for our future. So it's a team effort to keep our rural and artistic heritage alive. At Masmido, we work tightly with our local organizations, and we organize events, school visits, educational activities, um, and, and many other, many other things, many other, um, oh, concerts, here we go, okay. Our, fiel, um, our fields are cultivated in collaboration with local farmers, um, using sustainable and organic techniques, and we're creating an ongoing, which creates an ongoing process of learning and an opportunity for us and our visitors. We collaborate also with local wine sellers and producers, as well as artists and educators. And just as Mido welcomed his friends, um, here, Ernest Hemingway, Alexander Calder, Pierre Matisse, and many others. We, um, we welcome our visitors today to come and get inspired and, feel, and create as well. The farm and Mido's history and work also can help us understand so many other transformations of our society has gone through in the past century. Mas Mido is a window into the past to look also forward into the future. Um, and that's it. So, thank you. <laughs> oh. Thank you, thank you all. And uh, well, we we'll just uh, start to reflecting about this thematic of the, this panel. So maybe this, the, the, the questions will, it will be for all of you, of course. Um, and I would like to know um, behind behind its uh, scientific cultural uh, mission. Uh, uh, what is your opinion about uh, your uh, um, fun uh, social functions of your museums? Uh, because I noticed that you have uh, uh, not very different, but sometimes similar uh, relationships you, you, with your communities, of course, in a s different sense, 
But I would like to know what is the problem that you have or, or what is really the challenge of this social function nowadays. So I can start by migration, maybe. Social function, um, you mean for, uh, for the, the minority groups or in general? No, w w uh, I said be be behind the, the scientific and cultural mission, mm -hmm. uh, I suppose you have a very important social function mm -hmm. in your museum. So in what way it will be uh, developed in this moment in mm -hmm. your museum? Um, that it, it is a place where, where different groups meet. Um, for example, we had a group coming from elderly people, most of them Flemish, mm -hmm. um, with, uh, in Belgium. Um, and uh, when they came, um, one of the coordinators, he said to me, Isabel, I'm sure if I'm going to search, uh, I will have some of them with other origins. Um, and it, it was beautiful because those people came, um, they, they told a story as well, and we, we made a book of it with their stories, um, showcases as well, two of them. Um, and uh, we, with the museum, uh, recently we went to those organizations themsel themselves to talk about it. Um, and it was very nice because, um, well, Nice is not a good word. It was, uh, yeah, it felt re very good because uh, what we saw there was a recognition uh, for for the the team of migration and the refugees and an understanding as well. And do you think? Do, do you feel? Because um, the the thematic of your museum is sometimes uh, can. Well, uh, did you feel some uh, not be well uh, yes, it's understanding not in your community for example, yes, or outside? Yes, it's, it's not always easy, but although I have to say I like that, it's a challenge. <laughs> uh, recently we had uh, the, a group of last year guides, uh, they came with a teacher and I knew it would be a challenge. But I like that and I think it's important that people uh, dare to ask questions. Hmm. For example, there was a lady and she said to me what I really would like to know because it's what I hear that only the rich people can come here by boat. Hmm. Um, it wasn't a wrong question. It was, uh, and she said, I can't discuss it with my children because they become angry with me. They say, mom, um, and, and uh, I uh, um, explained to her that the, the, the researchers, uh, because I also work in another museum, the Red Starland Museum, um, show that the people who come, it's true. There are those who can pay uh, to come and they sell their houses. And most of the refugees stay uh, in the other countries. Besides, the most of the refugees are, are in, in Turkey, for example, and in other countries in Africa. So, but uh, what is beautiful is that this lady, for her, it was important uh, mm -hmm. and to get... Uh, that way she, she became to a recognition and even an admiration to people who had sold their house. Uh, and the fact that um, what we see is most of the people uh, at the Mediterranean Sea are young boys, that those are things that happened in the past as well. Okay. From Belgium, we had men, 200,000, going to uh, America with the Red Star Line boats. Mm -hmm. So we as well sent men going first and afterwards it was a family. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So uh, I suppose Nano is uh, one of the most uh, important missions is uh, so your function, uh, social functions. Can you tell me about the, also some difficulties or challenge? Yes. Am I on? I'm on. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, I think for us, and I mentioned this yesterday, we, we have these very connected communities, mm -hmm. but we haven't spent enough time mixing them all together, okay. you know? Mm. So, we, you know, everybody's doing their job and they're really focused on what the need is for those people. But then we should like, we kind of like, well, we should introduce them all <laughs> together, you know? And we have another community that's really connected to us, um, and that's past pupils, because, you know, thousands of people went through the, the schools that we, that are at the heart of our site. 
and they actually there are kind of communities that we kind of don't expect. Like when, when we were still doing the development, I kept finding Australian people outside trying to get in. And I was like, why are these Australian people here? And I realised that there was a huge diaspora of people who went to presentation schools as well. So we want to really connect with that community um, as well. And the past pupils have a very strong sense of ownership over the site and they are pure cock. They're really cock. And so I think mixing that community with then the other groups that we have on site will be a really be a really rich space for us. Um, you know, it's amazing to, to have, like when we did Diversity Academy, that people were like, I'm from Talker, that's like an area of Cork. And then the lady was like, yes, I am from El Salvador. And they were having a great chat with each other and connecting over kind of doing crafts and things like that. So mm -hmm. I think for, for us, the challenge uh, is just getting out there and telling people where we are. We're a very kind of hidden museum because we're a convent. It was meant to be hidden, but now it's quite frustrating. <laughs> and the, the, the biggest challenge that I have is not going mad when people come and say, this place is lovely. You should tell people about it. <laughs> <laughs> so please tell everyone. Um, yeah, so that's our, that's our ambition to just take over the world yeah. next. So next. You, don't, you don't find uh, sometimes any controversial about uh, between some, you know, between your areas, some, sometimes controversial because of questions of immigrants or something like this. Do you feel sometimes or no? I'm trying to think. Um, not so much, I, don't, I mean, no, not so much about mm -hmm. migrants and things like that. I mean, the one, the one area that's kind of controversial that we mentioned yesterday is just like that religion is, mm. like Ireland is a rapidly secularizing society and at the moment, you know, re religious organizations are, they're not very well looked mm -hmm. upon and that's our biggest challenge to just stay to steer a, steer a really calm path to keep telling our story and to you know explain to people what Nano Nagel Place is about and actually you know sometimes you have people coming in the door and actually we, we never have people saying anything bad about you know our, my, the migrant centre or it's, mm -hmm. mo it's mainly like Sister Bernadette was horrible <laughs> you know and I didn't enjoy my time in school here and actually our, our team at the front desk are brilliant at saying well that wasn't Nano Nagel's intention you know, Sister Bernadette lost her way a bit, maybe, and but come and reconnect, and that that was, probably that's the hardest one for us. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so uh, I heard you 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 work with your uh, farm community, I suppose, or uh, even more uh, some others. Yeah. Um, so the other uh, farm, the other farm area around uh, Masmido is is cultivated with uh, lo with a local farming um, business, and yeah. and we uh, and it's uh, cultivated with sustainable and organic techniques. Yeah. Um, and that uh, maybe just kind of yeah, yeah. jumping to the you know what challenges, for example, how to one of the challenges we have is to how to create, uh, for example, history collectively or create a collective history mm. based on an individual fi figure, which this connects a bit with, with you in a way, no? And we, we talk a lot about the values of Miro, no? Yeah, so we, sure. we try to say, okay, Miro is important, but Miro, what, what he considered important was this land, no? And this territory and the landscape. So that's one of the ways we try to kind of decentralize the focus no? and, and open to the, to the local community. Okay, okay. And without Miro, you never received the, the, the Council of Europe uh, award. <laughs> it was a statue from Miro. Okay, so uh, I suppose we have uh, five minutes. But I would like, if you want each other, you have some question you'd like to put to, to some, yeah? Um, mm. Go away, <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well I'm giving just, a chance. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, I think, um, well, no, I don't have a, a question. <laughs> I have many things in mind. Okay, okay. I, I really, I really enjoyed that idea that you're saying it's about the values and what would the person do now, which is so cute in Nano Nagel Place. Like, well, you know, it would be Greta Thunberg. So we, we, that's our next kind of. We really want to get involved in climate action. The Presentation Sisters are big environmentalists, and we're organically gardened as well. So to take the person and say, well, what would they do now, and and what were their values, I think is really important. It can't just be the focus on the person. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're, our next uh, idea is to kind of, uh, uh, well, I won't tell you, I'll yeah. tell you over car. <laughs> <laughs> Please, Isabel. Uh, yes, I was thinking about your question about social role. Um, what I wanted to add is also the, important, uh, the importance of, of empowerment. Mm -hmm. uh, that role, our chair uh, man, um, he's preparing an exhibition for the end of the year about an Entrepreneurs, is it that way you say it in English? Entrepreneurs. Um, he was searching, and 
we, we think he will never end his research because it is still more and more about entrepreneurs. Uh, if, if you start, it was, we began with Leonidas, Leonidas who came uh, at Belgium, who was selling ice cream uh, first in Greece and ended in Belgium for love. He started, he, he knew his wife in Belgium. Uh, and then he started with chocolate, but in a very little enterprise. He was poor at the beginning, and he he started with chocolate in Belgium. So our chairman is still, uh, and and that's a story of empowerment. Ac actually, entrepreneurs in Belgium, uh, different countries. Uh, even the last idea they came uh, because he's working with organizations is a défilé uh, of uh, mode défilé. So. Uh, and, and that's beautiful, the, the, the history of empowerment as well. So not only pain uh, recognition, but, but the empowerment. And that's mm -hmm. what I recognize, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, you, you're flipping the deficit lens of migrants, aren't you? You're saying they come, like you're getting somewhere else's best, and they're here to make money and to make new lives. So you're entre that's brilliant to kind of look at entrepreneurship by people who come into the country. I love that. So, oh, oh, good. No, no, just... <laughs> The, the stage is yours, not mine. <laughs> one, one, of the, uh, one of the challenges we have, uh, which is kind of peculiar, is that um, uh, in Munroj, we find that everybody has a story of Mido. So it, mm. it's a really mm. small town. Mm. And, and everybody, uh, so balancing between that everybody is a bit Mido and the historical facts, which sometimes, it's true, it's one of the challenges, uh, the, the art history, the historical facts and that everybody wants to be part of it is, is really is sometimes challenging. It's just something that you might have mentioned, I think maybe in your talk, uh, that this, and another uh, concept I find very interesting is the historical empathy that, that you talked about, Nano Hegel. This is also something that it's, uh, you know, this back and forth, you know, future, yeah. past. And okay, so any more questions now? No, no doubts about yeah. your, <laughs> okay. So, okay, you are in, we are just in time. So, thank you for accomplishing all the. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, before you leave the room, I have an announcement. Everyone, after this session is going to be some coffee, but also take the opportunity to put your names in the workshops for tomorrow. So please don't forget this uh, and, and put your names there. Yeah. Um, the next group, I don't know if you are here. It's, uh, yeah, please, the, um, it's the KBR Museum the Museum of Literature. Ah, hello. <laughs> Please. And the uh, Comenius Museum and Mausoleum. It's uh, everyone here? <laughs> Thank you. And please, before you start, you when you go up, so present, introduce yourself and, and your institution. Okay. Okay, so we are starting with the KVM Museum. Yeah, please. And take the opportunity to introduce yourselves also. <laughs> okay, hi. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone who made this event possible today. Um, my name is Rebecca Tierfeld, and I am communications officer for the KBR Museum. And today I will present it together with my colleague, Elena Savini, who is a scientific researcher for the museum. Um, the KBR Museum is, um, you can see it right here, it opened, this is the World Library actually that it's part of. So of the museum specifically, we opened the doors in 2020. Um, KBR is actually short for Koninklijke Bibliotheek van België and Bibliotheek Royale de Belgique, uh, which is um, short for uh, the Royal Library of Belgium in Dutch and in French. Um, at the library, which you can see here, is a huge building. 
We conserve many collections, um, old as well as contemporary, but at the KBR Museum we show far out the most um, precious and historical collection of, um, of KBR, which you can see here. Um, it is the Library of the Dukes of Burgundy, a unique and fascinating um, treasure of medieval manuscripts. At the time, it was actually one of the most luxurious and largest libraries, and today it forms the core of the National Library Collection of Belgium. Um, the book collection, of which you can see some books here, uh, was actually decorated by some of the most uh, famous and best miniaturists of the 15th century. During this brilliant time in history, uh, which is also sometimes called the Renaissance of the North, these book painters are illuminators. They worked very closely with the famous Flemish primitive painters. Um, on top of the books, we also show an overview of other cultural achievements of the time in the museum. And thanks to the loans of many um, Belgian museums, we can also show other um, objects, such as weapons, sculptures, altar pieces, and paintings. And from our own library collection, we also show old printed books, um, coins, and um, engravings. But uh, before we will tell you more about the museum, uh, we will have a look at it through video. In the very heart of Brussels, Belgium has been hiding a treasure for 600 years. A collection of manuscripts so exceptional that its name has stood the test of time, the Library of the Dukes of Burgundy. This unique collection of manuscripts from the Burgundian period is absolutely fascinating, even today. Preserved through the ravages of time and history, KBR now shares these gems with you in the KBR Museum. Admire beautifully illuminated manuscripts, paintings, altarpieces, weapons and jewellery as the 15th century comes to life before your very eyes. You decide what your museum visit looks like. Will you take the playful path, or would you rather be guided by an expert? The KBR Museum is so much more than something to look at. Characters dance on the ceiling, and stories are whispered into your ear. You can even get hands-on with history. Make your own miniature, try to figure out the date of handwriting, or become a copyist. There really is something for everyone at the KBR Museum. And did you know that the fragile manuscripts can't be exposed to light for too long? That's why the exhibits change twice a year. So you will discover something new every time. Come and discover the treasure of the Dukes of Burgundy. KBR, where time is treasured. So, um, as you saw in the video, visiting the KBR Museum is much more than just looking at books. Um, the museum tour starts in the 16th century Nassau Chapel, hidden in the modern KBR building. The tour is offered in five different languages and for three uh, different profiles, with an interactive uh, bracelet. Uh, visitors can select a language and a tour. There is an uh, in-depth tour, uh, a lighter discovery tour, and a playful tour designed for children, but actually uh, many adults uh, find it fun too. Um, so the museum wants to provide a multi-sensorial experience, which includes um, polyphonic music, soundscapes, and uh, tactile installations. Um, again, uh, as you saw in the video, visitors get to zoom in on details of miniature, design their own illustration, test their coping skills with a um, digital squill, quill, solve puzzles and explore the fully digitized library. Um, something special about us, the KBR mu Museum is a permanent museum, but it's showing a temporary exhibitions, meaning um, that all the artworks are regularly changed because of um, obvious conservation reasons. This is a challenge uh, that rewards us with the opportunity to change the narrative of the museum uh, regularly. And um, that's why you'll find new discoveries every time you visit. Thank you for listening. Um, please, the Museum of Ireland. Yeah, please.
Uh, good afternoon, um, everybody. My name is Simon O'Connor. I'm the director at the Museum of Literature Ireland, which we call Molly for short. Um, and it's a, it's a real honour to be uh, nominated in these awards and to be in the company of so many amazing, inspiring museums uh, from across Europe. Um, I have a lot to tell you about, so I'm going to go really, really quickly, I'm afraid. Um, uh, Molly is a new museum located on the original site of University College Dublin um, in Ireland. The university was founded in our buildings uh, in 1858, and many famous Irish writers um, uh, studied in the buildings over the years, um, most notably James Joyce, who you can see there, just second in uh, from the left, looking really upset because he didn't get a very good degree. Um, <laughs> And he graduated in our garden uh, in 1902. And uh, but just over 100 years later, a plan was hatched to create a Joyce exhibition um, in collaboration with the State National Library in those buildings. And despite Dublin being a UNESCO city of literature and Ireland having four, um, our little island having four Nobel uh, literature laureates, we didn't have a major museum of literature. Um, so our museum opened uh, in September 2019, just in time uh, for the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, major architectural interventions uh, were created uh, across the site and they, developed, they provided access across this very historic and complex three building um, area. Uh, we installed a variety of permanent um, and changing exhibitions, uh, lectures and seminar rooms, um, a very wonderful museum cafe, uh, and then we re-landscaped the gardens around the museum as well. Um, we focused on biodiversity um, uh, and aesthetics, uh, epicureanism. We even planted um, specifically to attract particular types of songbirds uh, so that the garden would sound beautiful uh, for people to sit in it and to read in it, which was really important. Um, most Dubliners didn't know um, that this area existed right in the middle of the capital city. Um, so opening it was like this really great surprise um, for the city and for the country. And from the beginning, we really wanted to subvert the uh, we wanted to subvert the idea of what people would expect a literature museum to be. And um, to do this, we felt that every aspect um, of the museum, from curatorial, digital learning, and um, even organisational structures, um, needed to have access and openness uh, at the very heart. Um, people from all communities uh, needed to be permitted to own this museum, um, and it had to become their place. Uh, it would have been the most predictable thing in the world to fill this museum with rare first editions um, and writer's materials, but that would have been too much, we felt, about the prestige of the object um, and not the art form. We see ourselves very much as a museum of an art form, um, but our visitors normally experience that art form privately, uh, typically in their own homes. Um, so we realised that our job is to recontextualise that art form and to encourage an interest in it, um, bringing writing to life for our visitors um, and to make them want to go home and read more and perhaps begin writing themselves. Um, we do this through very different types uh, of exhibits, but most importantly, we do this by collaboration with the living artistic community, actors, filmmakers, composers, theatre makers, um, visual artists. Uh, we collaborate across disciplines for all audiences, um, using living, living writers as curators of exhibitions and in our learning programmes, um, commissioning new artworks, um, and as you would expect, publishing books from the museum uh, as well. Only yesterday, actually, um, we launched, uh, I'm raging, I missed it, we launched this amazing project um, where we had uh, a group of incredible Irish poets helping school children collaborate on poetry um, that these kids wrote that's just been etched into Ireland's first satellite um, that's going to get launched into space later this year. So um, an absolutely amazing project for all those children to be involved in. Um, before we opened the museum, um, we knew that digital activity would have to play a primary role uh, in Molly, and not just at a technical exhibition level. Um, so six months before we opened, we built a recording studio uh, on the site and we launched a, a digital radio station, um, Radio Molly, as it's inventively called, uh, broadcasts our ever-growing digital archive 24 hours a day. Um, we produce literally hundreds of podcasts, readings and interviews every year, um, and our studio, and by extension the museum, um, within months became this um, uh, hub for the literary community um, of Ireland uh, uh, very, very quickly. Um, we also enjoy experimenting with digital programming um, and commissioning specifically for social media platforms. Um, some of our commission projects have had literally millions uh, of online visitors from across the globe. Our Irish literature has this huge um, audience around the world um, and that far exceeds the level of engagement actually that we can achieve in our physical site. Um, 
a less public aspect of our work, but I think the most important aspect um, is our learning programmes. So before opening, we developed early years learning programmes in partnership with local schools um, from areas of different levels of advantage and disadvantage, identifying specific needs in advance of the launch of the museum. Uh, On-site programmes were immediately replaced then during the pandemic with digital ones. Um, and these have actually surpassed our on-site teaching now. Uh, we're on track to ne reach nearly 7,000 young children across Ireland uh, this year through live digital classes. Um, my head of learning is very fond uh, of saying that there are no hard-to-reach audiences, only hard-to-reach institutions. Uh, and in the last two years, we've been actively making the museum more open and accessible um, to to, as a resource to groups that wouldn't ordinarily visit a place like ours. So in particular, working with groups representing refugees, homeless communities, children with no fixed addresses who aren't presenting at school, um, and even recent, more recently again, beginning to develop adult literacy classes. So we feel that a museum of literature shouldn't just be a place where you come to read, it should be a place where you can come to learn to read uh, as well. Uh, and just to wrap up, of course, you can't have uh, this culture on the outside without striving for that same culture on the inside. So we were ambitious to create a genuinely progressive, diverse uh, and inclusive working environment. Molly has a staff of 30 uh, across many ages and backgrounds with formal systems that we've devised that involve our staff in shaping our policies, our partnerships and the broader strategies of the museum. Um, as the director, I feel very strongly that I have an ethical responsibility uh, to create a workplace that has a positive effect uh, on its employees, both in terms of career and well-being. Um, we've developed a model that we call the Collaborative Studio, uh, which enables staff from all departments to train and work in different areas of the museum. And this, is how they, this has created a huge internal resource um, for us um, that brings a massive amount of curatorial flexibility in terms of what we can create on site. Um, we continue to embed EDI practices into our systems, um, and in the last two years we've been using the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals um, uh, as a toolkit and a compass for our work across the museum. Um, on a final note, uh, just to be able to present here today, I think is a real privilege. Our museum sensibility, I think, is echoed um, in so many of the EMEA values that we're hearing at this conference, um, in particular in terms of access and meeting the needs of a diverse local community, and it feels very special uh, to be among so many like-minded colleagues. So, thank you. Thank you so much. And please, Comenius Museum. Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the committee for the nomination. And also, I would like to thank uh, all the organizers for the wonderful work. Uh, although I am presenting the Comenius Museum and Mausoleum in the Netherlands, I am from the Museum of John Amos Comenius in the Czech Republic, and I will explain this connection later on. Uh, I think that many of you may know who John Amos Comenius is. He is called the Teacher, teacher of the Nations. Uh, he wrote works like Orbis Pictus, School by Play, and if I put it simply, if you study a language and you may act some scenes like somebody is a waiter and somebody is a customer, this is the school by play, which was designed by John Amos Comenius in the 17th century. He was a scholar, preacher, writer. He dealt with many topics from history, theology, cartography, diplomacy to physics or mathematics. And since he spent about 50 years of his life in asylum, he traveled the whole Europe because he was persecuted as a non-Catholic. He was a tireless fighter for the peace in the world. He wrote more than 250 books, and his most extensive book has over 1,700 pages. Also, the Czech Academy of Sciences has a whole department dedicated to Comenius, uh, and it's called Comeniological Department, and subsequently, the whole field of study called Comeniology was created. Uh, as I have said that Comenius had to travel through Europe uh, and seek some asylum, he spent the last five, uh, four, 15 years of his life in the Netherlands, and he's buried in Naden. Uh, he was, however, born in the Czech Republic, so we have now two museum of, museums of John Arms Comenius. One is in Uherski Brod, and the second is in Naden. 
Uh, there were some problems with the funding of the museum in the Netherlands. So the Ministry of Culture of the Czech Republic in 2004 decided that they will sponsor and cover all the costs of the Northern Museum. Now they do it through our museum and through the Czech Republic. So we cooperate on many projects. One of these projects was a new permanent exhibition which we were preparing since 2018. There are some starting points. Uh, the exhibition is limited only to one room. It's nearly 50 meters square. We have no authentic objects from Comenius life. We have to have in mind that there are visitors from the Czech Republic, but also from the Netherlands and from all other parts of the world. Because he is a study a lot, there are many theses written on Comenius. Uh, people with no previous knowledge come to the museum, but also people who are experts in Comenius. And also we needed to connect the Comenius mausoleum with the museum. This is the previous permanent exhibition, uh, which to be honest, uh, people just skipped around and they went straight to the mausoleum. So we of course wanted to avoid this. This is the mausoleum with Comenius grave. And this is the new exhibition which we opened just last year. Uh, the limited space, we decided to make several layers of the exhibition. There are some main topics on each wall, some uh, topics which give you further information and the time life of communist life in the bottom line of the wall. Then we used uh, these chips which you can use through your, through your own phone or borrow the phone from the reception. And then you can find over 50 more chapters. It's about 150 pages in a word. So you can spend really long time in the exhibition. If you want to uh, learn more about Comenius at your home, you can borrow or buy a catalog. And finally, we know that uh, people like to touch things and discover some information not only through reading. So we have multimedia elements which you can touch, like these flipping charts on the walls, but also some presentations and interactive maps, and also first 3D model of a picture which Comenius drew himself. It was his, his image of the world. Uh, important part of the exhibition are also these drawers where you can find more things, uh, more topics, uh, but also things that somehow connect the 17th century and our contemporary times. Uh, there are more views of the drawers, like uh, you can find that communist thoughts are really relevant still today. And you can take various quizzes and see his letters. Uh, since there are no objects, we decided to show dioramas from Comenius' life, and in them we placed objects. The whole exhibition is in three languages, the Czech, the Dutch, and English, and also all the supporting materials are in three languages. Uh, the last I want to show you is how we connected the mausoleum and the museum. It's through the materials and the designs used, but also through the picture, its original picture, bought from the Rijksmuseum, Museum, uh, the only old painting showing Comenius. So Comenius is there, is, he's looking all the time into the chapel where he rests. And uh, just to finish, we have also some programs for children, we host temporary exhibitions, book presentations, lectures, and for experts, there are conferences. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. And um, when I got the, the opportunity to moderate this session, I was thinking in, um, in an author that I love, Jorge Luis Borges, and he said that uh, if you can imagine paradise should be a library full with books. <laughs> so <laughs> you are living in some kind of paradises all day. Uh, and I was thinking, um, I, I want to 
discuss because you are taking care of uh, heritage that has to do a lot of with the nation and, or the idea of a nation in different ways and trying to put this in, in today uh, with nation probably looks a little different. And I would like to know more. You can start about trying to update this idea of nation represented by these manuscripts and these books, uh, in probably working with your community, or how, how do you work in, in updating these ideas? Um, well, it's a difficult question. <laughs> um, well, I think that the history of the Burgundian countries is uh, very, very fascinating and a good example of how uh, people with a very different uh, background and history can um, be together and become part of a nation and um, and share a, a, a culture, of course. And uh, maybe it's a very complicated history. And uh, myself, I'm not from Belgium, so I had to learn the, from the very beginning. Um, so it's a, a bunch of uh, counties and um, and uh, dukes, and uh, it's very complicated. And, and they spoke also different languages and. Uh, it became the uh, the the low count the Burgundian low countries and it was the um, uh, the the place the those people and the place witnessed a intellectual revolution that uh, passed a lot through books and manuscripts and arts in general so mm -hmm. it's interesting yeah I think maybe with the collection it's um, also interesting because it's actually also a very European collection at the same time. Mm. Um, the books of the Tutor Burgundy are actually in many languages, um, Dutch as well as French, but also Latin. Um, I think Elena can maybe add some languages, I'm not sure. Uh, yes, but mm. uh, it's not just like, I, I find it hard to just say it's a Belgian collection and I think it's actually the strength of it mm. because we actually also aim to um, really reach like a touristic uh, public too, because through this collection, we can actually tell a lot about the history of Belgium, but also about the rest of Europe. Mm. And, and for you, in you yeah, have these icons uh, of Irish literature there. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and what's interesting is that the reputation of Irish literature abroad is actually a really, um, it's interesting, it's quite a reductive representation mm -hmm. um, of the amount of communities that are involved in writing in Ireland and that have always been in this very rich oral culture. Um, that's also attached to the idea of nation, but there's a perception that Irish literature is kind of for dead guys. Um, so I think for us, uh, it's interesting, part of what we wanted to do from the beginning was to address that and actually show um, the depth of the history of the art form. Um, but then because it's an art form, it's nearly more relevant, um, not, ir not irrelevant to look at the past, but it's nearly more relevant to be, um, to be focusing on the art form of the present. Um, I mean, writing in Ireland uh, has always been a very democratic act and has always been concerned with writing back to power in some way and sometimes in very subtle ways mm -hmm. um, and that's still the case today so um, yeah so that's kind of how we that's how we go about it. Mm. Yeah. And in your case because it's a really interesting case a man born in one place moving to another two museums. Mm. Mm. Yes yeah, so our project is about the connection of two nations mm. uh, the Czechs and the uh, Dutch people uh, but since we deal with Chunamos Comunios, who basically wanted to unite the whole world, we also try to put the nations in the back and put uh, people and the unity to the front. Because uh, since he's visited several countries and for 40 years couldn't find home, he started to discover that it's not important where do you come from, what's your age, what's your religion, but the important thing is to realize that you are not alone in the world and that you have to maybe make uh, some compromises to live with other people, but the out that the outcome is the only thing that matters. So that's also something we want to show in our temporary exhibitions, which often focus on some part of the Czech culture and also on some part of the Dutch culture, but basically show that we can cooperate, we can uh, function together 
uh, even though it's sometimes challenging, <laughs> but I think the outcomes uh, are in the spirit of Comenius thinking. And following this that you said, how you connect this, how is the work that you do with this, with communities? What kind of communities are you working with, those in Czechia or those in, in uh, oh, the Czech. Netherlands? How are you working with communities with something transnational in a way? Actually, for a long time uh, before the Czechoslovak Republic was established, the museum in the Netherlands functioned through Czech immigrants. Mm. So they were the ones who kept it alive. Uh, and they are still in the museum today, although the average age is about 80 years old. <coughs> they still are happy for the connection with Comenius. And through these uh, people who were happy to find something to connect them with the Czech Republic. The museum uh, attracted more people from the Netherlands who are now uh, working there and who are the promising future of the museum. And otherwise, uh, for the Czech Republic and for the people in there, uh, the place in, in the Netherlands is uh, like something special because Comenius is the second greatest Czech according to one survey <laughs> <laughs> done in the Czech Republic. Uh, so, yeah, they come there to pay their respects. So, And, and one question about this radio project. Mm -hmm. It's um, something start from your staff mm -hmm. or it's something that you do together with uh, communities, university, how, how it works, this? Um, it's uh, well. I suppose first and foremost, it's uh, the idea was was that if we if we created a resource, that it would be a, it would be like a magnet and it would attract mm. different different groups, and then it would be something that would be easy for us to do. And we were very conscious that we're a partnership with the National Library of Ireland, and that collects a lot of the material history um, of literature, uh, whereas nobody was really collecting the digital history of literature. And and for future research, um, the idea of um, recording interviews, recording readings, things like that. Um, so we started it, uh, I mean, very, very modestly. It was a small mobile recording studio. It's a kind of a full spec one now. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, we were very, very open. We, at first, we've had to kind of narrow <laughs> how much of it we do um, because there's just so much demand on it. Um, but, yeah, we kind of felt it would also make a statement that we were going to be a museum that was taking digital collecting and digital activity very seriously. So even, like, we opened that in February 2019, um, but the museum didn't open yeah. until September. Yeah. How, is work, how, how it works today with this radio? It's, it's a lot of activity or...? Yeah, huge, yeah. Amount, yeah, yeah. huge amount of activity still. Um, we, we sometimes have, I mean, our marketing our very, very small marketing team, who are also our digital team, yeah. um, they, they kind of complain that they have too much to talk about. Okay. You know, <laughs> it's like... Ah. Yeah. Yeah. And, and in your case, you were pointing out this, that you need to change often objects and, and reshape the exhibitions that you have. And how is the, the comments and re reactions from the public in, in this case? Do you have... a Reactions? Are they want to see the, the, the item that disappeared last month, or do you have these kind of conversations, or what kind of old objects you are going to choose? Or um, yeah, it's uh, quite a challenging job. So uh, we regularly change everything that is on paper or parchment, parchment mm. uh, very tricky um, uh, materials. Uh, and people are curious. Uh, we announce uh, when the, the change is going to come and we say that we're going to turn the page, uh, literally, uh, and we're going to show uh, something completely different. Uh, luckily, the collections of, the, of KBR are very <laughs> huge, so we have uh, plenty of choice. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's a lot of work because we write every time a new text uh, in the three profiles, so adapted to different um, type of, of experience. And the three levels need to be translated in uh, five languages, so it's <laughs> a lot of work. Um, but it's rewarding every time we have um, something new and people who want to come back and who are curious to know what's going to happen next. And 
yeah, it's also very uh, alive. There are a lot of uh, activities that go with the changing, with the turning of the page. So, yeah, it can be uh, concerts, workshops, uh, mm -hmm. practical workshops, or uh, um, conference uh, talks. Uh, very different, something very, uh, yeah, different every time, and it brings people uh, back. Yeah, we also try to work around teams. Um, so the last six months, we actually did um, work around, like we called our um, museum focus, which is Havana Lettre. So we actually talked about the portrayal of women uh, in these 15th century manuscripts, which is really interesting and also relevant. Um, we, for example, did a museum night with also uh, yeah, a lot of young people, a lot of like um, people working around gender perspectives, for example. Um, so we also really try to yeah, take these changes as an opportunity to also um, yeah, show how relevant uh, these historical views are and how we can learn from them, mm -hmm. um, yeah, take them to today's perspective. I was thinking a question, and I think we have good time. Yeah. Uh, it's, um, we, are, we are in a time in the world that, for example, younger generations are almost bookless. <laughs> the books are disappear, but not not in the, way, in the way that we usually have, but coming in a new, like digital, and how, how you see your institutions from now to the future in this kind of, you, you can be wild. What, what do you want to do for the future with this? Please. Um, yeah, it's very interesting. Uh, I know that, uh, for example, at KBR, so the Royal Library, I know that we uh, archive uh, all kind of publications and we, also uh, preserve, uh, of course, heritage documents such as the manuscripts. But I know that we archive also um, all kind of uh, digital publications. Uh, we archive uh, sites and um, uh, contents from a social networks. There is a re research project uh, that is called Be Social that is about social networks and we actually archive uh, hashtags as a form of uh, uh, content and um, I, I, we think that it's going to be interesting to know about these new forms of uh, of information and culture in the future and so we are very open with the uh, new forms and new challenges but uh, uh, I forgot what I was <laughs> saying. <laughs> yeah, we, we really put a lot of efforts in um, digitization. Uh, we think it's very important. Uh, I do I have to admit that a lot of other colleagues could uh, <laughs> tell way more, um, way more interesting things about this, though. Yes. Um, in terms, I mean, we we deal with we deal with an art form that's mass produced um, and relatively easily available physically and digitally, anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but your question in relation to younger audiences is really interesting because where we deal some, where we often deal with folklore as well and orally transmitted narrative, mm -hmm. um, we find that that's, we're also dealing with that now with younger audiences as well, because we're doing an awful lot of work with spoken word artists, um, teenagers, rappers, things like that. And it's really, re and we see them as being part of that exact lineage um, from, you know, oral storytellers through to writers, through to, you know, experimentalists like Joyce and Beckett and these people up through the century and then back out into oral transmission. Um, so uh, it's really important that we're always active with those artists as well right now because we're collecting that work. Mm. New kind of literature. Also. Sorry? It's a new kind of literature or a new kind of... Absolutely, uh, yeah. ...spoken on, yeah. Mm. And uh, so your question was... How you see your institution intended. in the future? Yeah, I know. Oh, well, mm. But you ask about the children. So mm -hmm. uh, when we work with children, we try to stick to the traditional matters. Mm. Because I would would say age 5 to 15. Since we deal with the 17th century, we go back to that time. They can touch handmade paper. They are explained uh, what the book printing and what the uh, development of the new text techniques meant that now they can access books through electronic devices. Yeah. But uh, back then, a book was basically your property it was something very valuable, so we want children to leave our museum knowing that uh, what they can ha have now easily was not like that always. Mm. Okay, thank you so, so much, and uh, please send a prayer.
Um, don't forget to sign to the workshops. <laughs> <laughs>